morning. Last Sunday we lit the candle of joy. We light it again along with the candles of hope and love as we remember that Christ who was born in Bethlehem will come again to fulfill all of God's promises and bring us everlasting peace and joy. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of peace. Peace is a word that we hear a lot as it's one of the things that we hope for. Christ brought the possibility of peace between God and man when he first came to us, and he will bring everlasting peace to our world when he comes again. The prophet Isaiah called Christ the Prince of Peace, and that the greatness of peace of his government will have no end. When Jesus came to earth, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace will be blessed and shall be called the children of God. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and that through him, peace is found. Peace, peace is, is like the light shining, shining in a dark, dark place. place. As, As we, we look at this candle, candle we, we celebrate, celebrate the, the peace, peace we find in Jesus Christ. Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the peace that we have available to us as we walk in faith and trust in you. We ask this morning that as we wait for, for your promises to be finally fulfilled and for you to come again, that, that your peace would remain present with us in every day. Help us today, Lord, and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing peace with others. Lord, this morning we pray for uh, Pastor Chanel and Vista Covenant Church. I pray your blessing on their service today, the ministry that they bring to their, 
their rural community there and uh, just outside of Wasika and as they bring ministry even in town I would just pray your blessing and that you'll provide for them as a congregation that you'll guide and lead them and Pastor Chanel as he leads them give him wisdom and insight Lord and just to empower him by your spirit we think of our friends in Ukraine I pray for an end to that war and uh, we pray for Anya and Galena as they lead the churches of praise as they uh, pastor at churches and uh, and give it direction to the to the union of churches we pray for your blessing on the kids ministry that's coming up for Christmas that that will just be a time where uh, refugee kids are going to hear the message of Christ and their families will experience uh, joy and and safety in, in these moments of war and we just pray your, your presence to be felt there and uh, God that you'll just continue to provide for the needs uh, to help care for and, and uh, minister to those who are are, are homeless and they're in, they're in shelters and all of those crazy things that are happening in that war situation. And Lord, we pray for our missionaries today. We think of the Lees. Uh, as they minister in Cambodia, we pray your blessing on their ministry there and their family. Now, as many of their kids are, are home and studying at university, uh, God, that you'll just bless this family, especially at this Christmas season. And as they continue ministry in Cambodia, give, give them wisdom and guidance as they minister and and, uh, and care for the Cambodian people as sharing the message of Christ. And we pray as well for uh, Bob McKay as he uh, wraps up a time of ministry in Georgia and then moves to another stage of life as this season comes to an end for him. We pray you'll continue to strengthen and uh, bring health to his body. Just a sense of encouragement knowing that, uh, that he has fulfilled the call that you've placed in his life. Now as he transitions, we just pray continued blessing, strength, and encouragement pray for church family members today lord we pray for judy gilbertson i just pray your blessing on her life lord that you'll bring wholeness and strength to her body that she will feel your presence your peace at work in her life and uh, that you'll bring healing in her body today that lord strengthen and encourage judy pray as well for tim and rubley bice for angel and amaya lord that this family will feel surrounded by your grace your love and that you will bless and encourage them and uh, that this would just be a week lord as they celebrate christmas and that, that, uh, the truth of, of the message of christ would ring true in their hearts and their home and uh, lord now as we worship you in song this morning we pray that you'll just speak to our hearts draw us near to you as we worship in jesus name we pray amen It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. 
Oh, come. 
of sin. You've made a way for us to be set free from slavery to sin. And that, that you are Emmanuel. You are, you are with us. You are with us at all times in every situation. In the good, the bad, the ugly of life, you, you are with us. And we can turn to you for strength and hope and peace and joy. And we can receive your love in, in all occasions. God, we thank you for your great faithfulness. Lord, we just think of our missionaries scattered around the globe today and many of them far from home, far from family. Uh, we just pray your, your peace in their hearts and their lives today, that they will experience a freshness in relationship with you, that you will renew their strength and encourage them in the ministry that you've called them to do and the places 
that you've called them to be. Uh, that your hand will be on them, guide and direct, bless them. And Lord, as we move through our service this morning, uh, we just ask that you'll speak to our hearts. Help us to hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. You could be seated. We have a short video this morning from, uh, um, it's, it'll say on the bottom of the screen, General Superintendent. And for many of you, you don't know quite sure what that is. A General Superintendent, Doug, Reed, or Doug Clay is his name, Pastor Doug Clay. And he's the national leader of the Assemblies of God. That's the, the, the uh, denomination that we're a part of. We don't like to call ourselves a denomination, but that's what we're a part of. And and Pastor Doug Clay is our national leader, and uh, he sent a video out this week and just said, hey, I would love to have our churches all show this. It's, it's relatively short, and just encouraging us as, uh, as followers of Christ to be involved in our national week of prayer and fasting. And so let's go ahead and watch that video. More than just a liturgical and church tradition, weeks of prayer are vital for the health and growth of the local church, and not just the local church, for you individually. I want to encourage you to join us on the journey of the week of prayer, January 7th through the 13th. I'm actually on the set right here where several key spiritual leaders have provided great resources to help you go to deeper levels of maturity in your prayer life. I'm excited about what God is going to do in this week of prayer. That's coming up in January. We're looking forward to, to spending some time in prayer and fasting in that first full week of January. I'm going to have our ushers come if they would at this time. We're going to receive the morning tithe and offering. We thank you for your faithfulness over the course of this year in, in uh, tithing and giving offerings to help our missionaries uh, be able to stay in the field and do the work that God has called them to do. We're going to ask the Lord's blessing, and then as we receive the offering this morning, I'll make a couple of announcements. Father, we thank you uh, for the gift that you've given us. You're one and only. You held nothing back. You didn't give us a percentage of your love. You gave us 100% of your love. And as we give back a portion of our, of our uh, finances to show our love to you, God, receive that as a, as a love offering and, and that it would be a sweet-smelling savor. God, bless this offering. Help us to be faithful stewards of all that you've entrusted to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. So a couple of things just to be aware of, everybody could be aware of. Uh, Christmas Eve service tonight at 8 o'clock, candles, carols, and communion will be back here in the sanctuary. It's about a one-hour service. We would love to have you uh, come and join us as we... Uh, relight the candles again tonight and light the Christ candle. We'll sing a number of Christmas songs as we did even this morning. We'll be along that process, and so we appreciate your help with that and your attendance to that. Uh, just a reminder of the uh, Ukraine uh, Christmas party that's going to happen in Kravoy Rog. They're anticipating about 1,000 kids, and a number of you have already contributed towards that. A $5.50 a buy gift for a kid that will attend that large party, Christmas party, and just a, another week as they celebrate Christmas, uh, what we think of as Epiphany is kind of their Christmas. It's usually January 7th, and so their celebration will be sometime between our Christmas and, and their Christmas, probably closer to New Year's, but so there's still time if you'd like to give toward that, and uh, we got a week of prayer fa and fasting coming up. The information is in the bulletin for you this morning. Also, you'll see uh, announcements about uh, uh, bylaws if you want to make a change to that or if you want to nominate for somebody for church council member. That information is there and how you can get involved in those uh, is in the bulletin. I want to remind you that uh, the bread man is here. Um, Daryl is here. He's uh, making bread every week and have him out on the table. If you want to take one of those loaves of bread, you can just leave a donation and we'll use those dollars as we go to Ukraine the first week of uh, first part of February and, and doing ministry that'll help with some aid ministry that'll take place in our time that's there. And so that'll be greatly appreciated. So we're going to let our kids ages three through sixth grade be dismissed to go to junior church, the children's church this morning. Tony's got a great lesson for him. He's excited to share um, about some of the Christmas story with them, I think, this morning. So they'll have a great, great lesson and time in there. So we're going to look into the Word this morning. This is our, our fourth and final week of this series we've been working through. We've called White as Snow. 
If you've been with us or, or tracking along on the, on the video or the live stream or listening to the podcast, you know we've covered a fair amount of ground since we got this series started. We began talking about in early in Isaiah chapter 1 as God is speaking to Isaiah and he's telling the people of Israel about how horrible their sin is and how great it is and how heavy it is and all of those things. But he doesn't stop with that. He recognizes that, but then he says, come here and let's talk about this. I've got a way we can fix that. And that's the beautiful piece of white as snow, that no matter how great our sin may be or may have been, God says, I can fix that. I've got a plan for that, and his name is Jesus. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and then we talked the second week about Emmanuel, God with us. And, and then last week we were talking about redemption, that, that God sent Jesus to redeem creation, to set us free from slavery to sin, to be bound from that bound piece of sin that holds us back. And, and what an amazing gift that the Father has given to us in that. And Paul says that the, in Romans, he said, thank God for his indescribable gift, redemption and the hope of salvation, the, the gift of Jesus. And, and in this season that is filled with gifts, it's important for us to take time to remember Jesus in the midst of the holiday hustle and bustle and all the pieces that we not lose track of. This is really all about, it's all about Jesus. So we remember the freedom that comes through Jesus. Um, we like to think about freedom comes from the American military and they, they set us free from, from all of that stuff. But true freedom really comes from Jesus. And, and not just freedom as Ephesians chapter 1 tells us we have all the riches of God's grace lavished on us through his son or as as we saw last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 it says for everyone's one of God's promises is yes in Christ and what more could any of us do but muster up a hearty amen to all of God's promises being yes, being fulfilled in and through Christ? What more can we do except simply receive God's extravagant love that it's offered to us? And, and the crazy thing is that he has made it available, but he doesn't push it on us. He says, Here, here's my extravagant love. Here's what I've done for you. Here's how I have made a way for you to be forgiven of all of your sin, to be set free from that, but now I'm going to let you choose. Do you want this gift? Do you want to unwrap this and let this thing unfold in your life? Or do you kind of like walking in sin and in slavery to sin? And he gives us that choice to do that. So the question for us today is, what do we do? What do you and I do in response to this divine redemption? How can we even begin to respond to God so full of kindness that he moved on our behalf to bring us back into a right relationship with him? Thankfully, the Bible, and specifically the Apostle Paul in his writings, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has left us with some amazing direction and insight in, to, in response to that very question. Now, before we jump into all of that, let's just take a moment in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for portraying your life and paying the price so that we might be redeemed, that we might be made new, and that we could gain eternal life. Lord, you've paid the price of redemption for all of us, and in that, we are made new. Praise be to your name. Lord, we are, we're new creations in Christ Jesus. Help us to hear from you today through your word and by your spirit. God, I would ask that you would help me to be able to communicate clearly what you desire for us to hear, and that you'll help each of us to hear exactly what you desire for us to hear as individuals as well. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So if there, I think if there's anyone who could ever speak uh, authoritatively about a life that is sold out to Christ, it is definitely the Apostle Paul. As we think about his life, as we think through the, what we know about his life, the, the, and, and obviously there are, there are hundreds, maybe thousands and thousands of people who, who have also traded their lives to follow Jesus. But it's the thoughts of the Apostle Paul that have been immortalized for us in the Scriptures that we can read and study and learn from and grow from. And, and it's, 
And it's his second letter to the church at Corinth that holds so many amazing truths for us, but possibly none greater than those that Paul shared in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so the, the title for our message this morning, and we'll be kind of talking through this, is we have the ability to be made new. And, and as my body's wearing out, and I got a knee replacement, and I'm thinking about maybe needing another one, I'm looking forward to that holy made new piece. <laughs> I, I've been made to new spiritually, and I enjoy that. I walk in that spiritual newness, but I'm looking for the whole piece, man. <laughs> I want it all. I want that one day when I get to heaven, and it's all brand new, and no wore out parts. What a great day that will be. So at the very top of Paul's list in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is verse 17, which says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is past and the new has come. This reality is so completely profound that many people struggle and have difficulty comprehending how we can be made new in Christ. It, it's, like a, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, or there's some other natural transformation that we could compare it to. Maybe, maybe part of why it's so difficult for us to understand is because it is holistically divine transformation. Maybe, maybe redemption, salvation, and sanctifications are realities that we not only live by, but we have to embrace them by faith because in many cases they, they don't make full sense to us. We can't fully comprehend how it all works. And for just a little more thought on that, this is what 17th century English pastor and theologian, one of my favorite commentators to read from and study from, Matthew Henry says this about being made new. He says, the renewed man acts upon new principles by new rules, with new ends, and in new company. The believer is created anew. Her heart is not merely set right, but a new heart is given to her. He is, he is the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Through the same as a man, though the same man, he is changed in his outward character and conduct. These words must do and mean more than an outward reformation. The woman who formerly saw no beauty in the Savior that she should desire him now loves him above all things. And what, a, what an incredible truth as he lays that out for us. If you've ever get close to someone who's experienced a radical conversion to Christ, and, and probably most of us in the room have been close to someone at some point in our lives that that their life was a mess, and then they met Jesus. And we know, we know the transformation. We begin to see that as it begins to play out in, our, in their lives. You hear them talk about faith the way Matthew Henry described it. You'll hear them talking differently. You'll see them pursuing different priorities, spending their money differently, hanging around different people. And maybe most importantly, they'll be in and among others in fellowship and in communion. And the truth is, that's exactly where they want to be. No one's forcing them or coercing them to do that. No, it's, it's on the contrary. This response seems completely justified and a right response to the redemption, the reconciliation and salvation that was given to them by Jesus. Everything in their life has is changing or has changed because of their relationship with Christ. I think about when my dad came to Christ and the changes that begin to immediately happen as he became a new man. It wasn't Sunday afternoons at Del Mar Bar anymore. It wasn't stopping for a beer on the way home from work and not getting home until midnight. It wasn't a lot of those things. And some of those friendships that he had from the places that he frequently, they, they just kind of drifted apart. They weren't there anymore. He still knew those people. They were still friends, but, but it was different. There were different priorities. And suddenly, I couldn't miss a church service anymore because Dad made sure that we were going to be there every time the door was unlocked. Or if somebody had a key in the door, oh, I hear the key going in the church door. Let's go. We just lived a mile away, so he could tell. <laughs> and everything changed, and it was, it's such a radical thing. We, we see this played out in the life of the Apostle Paul because he himself was, had experienced this kind of a radical transformation that I'm describing. 
He went from persecuting and killing Christians to becoming the most prolific preacher and church planter of his era. And when he talks about it throughout his letters, he talks as if there was no other option that he had. He, he was a man on a mission, and, and neither death or stonings or shipwrecks or scourgings or anything else was going to keep him from sharing the truth about Jesus with everybody he could come in contact with. He, he called it being compelled. So let's think about that word compelled for a minute. To be compelled to do something is really, it's kind of a big, it's a big deal. The definition of compelled being this, to drive or urge forcefully or irresistibly. To be honest, sometimes I feel compelled by the irresistible smell of fresh baked pizza. <laughs> sometimes I feel compelled by the smell of what's coming out of my coffee pot in the morning. I, but I'm pretty confident that's not what Paul was talking about. <laughs> Carl, you're shaking your head at me. Come on. <laughs> that's not what Paul was talking about at all, was it? He wasn't thinking about pizza or coffee. In fact, if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes there, For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion, if one died for all, then all died. Think about this for just a moment. This letter from Paul is a response to things that he had heard about the Corinthian churches, which means some within those churches were accusing Paul and others of being out of their minds because of their faithfulness and pursuit of a closer relationship with Christ. One has to wonder what exactly were they doing that others would think that they were out of their mind. Aside from planting churches and training and strengthening churches and building up local churches and, and seeing new converts coming to Christ on a consistent basis, apparently they were doing those things with, with such fervor and passion that some people began to think they were crazy. But Paul answers this by saying, no. In fact, it was the love of Christ that has compelled us to do what we do. We love Christ so much is what he's saying. We love, I love Jesus so much that I can't help but do those things. He has so radically changed my life, I can't help but go and tell other people around the world that, that they can have this same experience that I had. The irresistible unfathomable, death-defeating, whole world-redeeming love of Christ came into Paul's life, and he knew he could share that with everyone, and they could have the same experience. It compelled Paul and others in the early church to, to live the lives that they did. It compelled them to trade all that they had, their very lives in most cases, so that others would, could know the redemptive love of Jesus. They were guides. Showing others the way home, showing others the way through the darkness and into the, the marvelous light of relationship with Christ. They were what Paul called ambassadors of Christ. Ambassadors of Christ. So that I'm assuming that most of us in the room have a general understanding of what an ambassador is and what their job is. An ambassador... Is a, is, a, is a credited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. And what's interesting about an ambassador is that they are accredited and then sent to a foreign land to dutifully represent their home country. As a comparison, we, you and I, if we're walking in relationship with Jesus, if we've had our sins forgiven, we are accredited in Christ to represent the kingdom of light in foreign lands. Or as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, the dominion of darkness. See, when, when you become a Christian, when you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a new creation. This world immediately ceases to be your home, which if you want to, to read more about that, the, Paul's teaching on that, he talks about it in depth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can read through that whole chapter. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 18, he writes this, everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to Christ. All of this, Paul would tell us, all of this is from God. And it was God who chose to give you and me as well, every one of us who trust in Jesus, this ministry of reconciliation. God chose us to be diplomats for the kingdom of light, to tell others about his redemption, the salvation he offers, to tell everyone that it's available through repentance and that we will experience his grace and love as we follow through those steps. When, when faced with questions, the big question, what more can we do but simply receive the extravagant love of God, we can share the good news with others. We can be divine guides, helping others on their way back to their eternal home with the creator of all things. We can understand the responsibility we have in Christ to be representatives of light, of love, of redemption and salvation. Friends, that is our charge. If we're walking in relationship with Christ, that's the charge that has been given to us. This, this, this is the reality that compelled Paul, the other disciples, as they invested their lives in hundreds of thousands of others throughout our collective Christian industry, began to understand, that's my charge as well. I have to be about the work of the kingdom. I have to be sharing this message. This is, the truth is, that's our journey home. That's our journey to heaven. Until God takes us back, Revelation tells us that at the end, in heaven, there's going to be representatives from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group around the throne. Today, we know that there's a roughly 8,000 people groups, different language groups, different culture groups, different uh, skin color groups, whatever it may be. There's about 8,000 different groups that have never heard the message of Christ. So we've got work to do. We're, we should be compelled to help get them the message, whether that's us going to take the message or continuing to support ministries, missionaries who are going to take that message. It's the way home for all of us, that none would perish, that, that people, everybody would have a chance to hear that message. One of the things I, I really look forward to and appreciate about the Christmas season is the opportunity to return together where it all began. On some level, this is our pilgrimage. We return year after year back to the manger. We gaze upon our newborn king and we thank him again for being with us, for being Emmanuel. We have opportunities to thank him and to let him know how difficult and or amazing our year has been, and we pray for his continued mercy and grace to lead us through another year. But God says to Israel, let's reason together. Let's talk about this together. What, and, and he wants us to know, what are we doing to share this gift this year, this, this week, today? What are we doing to share this gift? It, it's not meant for just us, but that the world would know. What opportunities are we taking or creating to bring others along with us on our journey to eternity with God? Who are you inviting to come with you in, on the pilgrimage back to the manger? As an ambassador of the kingdom of light, I would argue that our responsibility is to accurately share with others the realities of redemption, of reconciliation, of salvation, and the love and grace of God that is available to every person. God has completely wiped your sins away. If you've asked him to forgive your sins, they have been wiped away. He said, though your sin be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. And as we come to repentance, though it was scarlet, though our past is sinful and it's made, been made white, it has been forgiven. He's made us white as snow, and he sent his son to be with us, to be one of us, to bring redemption through his life, death, and resurrection. And now it's our turn to bring the gift of Jesus to others. 
He's in heaven praying for us that we'll have the courage, that we'll, he'll give us the words as we begin to share. He wants that message to continue moving forward. So as we wrap up this morning, we're going to close in prayer in just a minute. I, I want to, as we think about this coming week, tomorrow's Christmas Day, as we think beyond Christmas Day and we look toward New Year and the next month and the full year that is ahead of us, I want us to consider who you interact with the most and how you can share the message of Christ with them. Try to make a habit of returning to the same coffee shop or grocery store or gym or whatever it might be to get to know people there and pray for opportunities to share the good news of the light of the kingdom of God. I promise you that, it, that if you begin to pray, God, help me to see people around me wherever I happen to be that need the message of Christ, I can promise you if you begin to pray that, he's going to help you see them. He's going to help you feel like, I'm compelled to tell them something. I'm compelled to invite them to a church service or whatever it might be. You'll begin to see and have those opportunities. It, it may not actually, probably will not look or feel exactly like you thought it should or turn out exactly how you hoped that it would. But God will use your availability and willingness for His glory. Sometimes you anticipate, I'm just going to get to lead this person to Christ. And the reality is going to be that you get to plant a seed for Christ. And then someone else is going to come along and water that seed. And someone else will come along and get to harvest that seed. But he's going to give us opportunities if we ask him. And so this is the perfect time of year to offer the greatest gift of all time to those around you. Let's, let's close. We're just going to close in a word of prayer. God, we, we pray that, I pray, God, that you'll use me, that you'll use all of us in this room, in this, this season, and then in the new year to share the gift of Jesus, to share the message that, that though sins can be heavy and dark and damaging to our lives, that, that we can sit with you and you can wash them away Remove the stain, remove the heaviness and give us joy and peace and hope for tomorrow. God, help us to be bearers of that gift to those that we work with or go to school with or that we see in the shopping areas. That we can be sharing that gift of, of your grace and mercy, of your unfailing love for mankind. That we can know forgiveness of sin and walk in the joy of your salvation. God, help us, help us to be ambassadors day in, day out, that we're going to be looking for those opportunities to represent you and empower us by your spirit to represent you well, to live what we say and say what we live, that people can see the goodness of the kingdom. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Sue's going to lead us in this song, Emmanuel, again, and then uh, we'll close in a word of prayer. Let me just remind you, before we even sing that, Christmas Eve service tonight, 8 o'clock, candles, carols, and communion. We'd love to have you come and be a part of that service with us tonight. Let's, let's sing. <laughs> Sue Schleiger, she'll close us in prayer.